does that reconcile with the idea that it seems to me that that's an, an emphasis on the idea that students are going to be in the Oregon system through that whole time. And um, so I can understand if we're talking about all Oregonian students that have actually been here or at least been here for a long time, but at the same time, our universities are increasingly nationally and internationally focused. And I know that at PSU, our move towards being um, a research one university kind of means that we're always looking to engage nationally. And um, the other universities, all of Oregon universities, are trying to get more out of state students, more international students for funding. So I'm wondering how that reconciles and fits together with the piece about seamless from early childhood. Um, so a couple of things on that, and I'm sure my colleagues on the panel will, will add to this. In terms of the research agenda, I've always tried to describe the research agenda as being integral to my teaching. So I would say, for instance, that I never taught better than when I had my own research material to provide to my students. And I'll give you a really great example. And this is how I think I, I think about research, is that it, it's a, there are these concentric circles that faculty work on on any campus, right? They have research, they have teaching, and they have service, whether that's to their own institution or to their discipline. For me, research provided an example of exceptional teaching. So just one example. Oregon fights with the federal government all the time. Federalism is, is fought hardest in the West, and in particular in Oregon. So when I would take my Government 101 class and try to teach them about federalism and concepts of the founding, that sounded really far away and abstract and unimportant to a contemporary student until I would say, let's talk about death with dignity. So let's talk about death with dignity in terms of the interaction between the federal government and the state government of Oregon. And that research that I had done in that area made that subject come alive. So what I would say is that research is an integral part of the teaching and learning experience. It enhances teaching. It's not a zero-sum game. So when we do research on a campus, it doesn't necessarily take time away from the classroom. It can enhance the classroom in really critical ways. So that's one piece of your question. The piece about the, the seamless component, which I think is so important, another <laughs> So one of the things that we've been working on with, with our community college partners here in the metro area is what we call co-admission practices. So you take a student who is thinking about where they might want to land, and perhaps they are a first-generation student, perhaps they're a low-income student, maybe not. But what you hear from them is that they might like to explore PCC, and they might end up at Portland State. With a co-admission practice, what you say to that student is, we will admit you simultaneously to both campuses. And here's the power of co-admission. It allows the student to, um, who might perhaps otherwise be intimidated by a large urban metro campus, to make that move back and forth between PCC and PSU on his or her own timeline. So I think back to my own experience. I didn't step foot on a college campus until the day I got dropped off on one. It might have been helpful to me as a, as a student um, from my background to have been able to kind of move back and forth. So when we have co-admission with PCC, it allows students to use our resources on campus here at the same time that they're taking classes at PCC, which makes the transition smoother. It provides them access to our advisors earlier, our library earlier, our social activities earlier. And we know then that those students are retained at higher numbers and frankly just get socialized into the academy in a much easier way. So that's a way, when you say seamless, that's what seamless means to me. Really working closely with our community college partners. And they might decide never to come to PSU. They might decide in the end, as your question suggests, that, well, gosh, I think I did okay, and now I'm heading out of state. That might happen. But the important thing is that we've provided the opportunity through collaborative services to make that transition as comfortable and as efficient and easy as possible. So to me, that's what seamless can, can mean. If I could, uh, I'd like to add a few things. And I actually want to, I've been thinking about the question before. The only part to that last 
question I'd like to address a, a bit is the international part of it. There's values to you know bringing international students here in terms of the diversity factor, but also the changing world that are we're, it's no longer the environment that I left college, and so there's added value. But the pr primary one of the primary strategies, in addition to raising money on students and raising tuition. It's been a you know an economic model to fund uh, education for Oregonians because we can charge three times the tuition, whether it's out of state or international. But but the point I want to make is I had a brief conversation with the acting president of Western. And Western Georgia pointed, you know, their strategy really was leading the way and going to China and other places to uh, get uh, money, international students to then subsidize first generation Latino students in Western. And that happens in others, but Western has really done a great job on both sides of that equation. But the story I want to tell you is, he just got back from China, and China now, they first of all, everybody's figured out the strategy, George. Everybody's doing that. Oregon, so how we continue to do that, but here's the point that I didn't know. But now in China, at least his sources, they're wanting to cut of the action. They figured out what we're doing, and they want money per student to subsidize their efforts to do this. Well, and so when you combine both of those, the margins on this aren't going to work going forward. So it's not a really the greatest long-term strategy by itself. But on your on the question beforehand, you know, how do we all do this in an equitable way that's fair for everyone? including uh, the business community. I think first, it's going to take seeing that we really are working together, you know, because we can't pick K to 12 versus community college and higher ed. We have to, we really have to do this. And then measuring results instead of just seat time. I mean, we have to do those things in order to set up the larger conversation. And then we have to build the advocacy effort out there and then we've got to come up with a solution, and it's not going to be a, getting rid of the inventory tax. That's not going to be it. But we're going to have to come up with a solution where everybody contributes. It can't be done just on students. It can't be done just on property taxpayers. It can't be done just on the business community. We're going to have to come up with the principle that everybody benefits in terms of the state and the economy and the young people. Everybody contributes. I want to just jump in and, and um, you know, going to the question about the, the seamless um, education system. Uh, we talked before about the, the low rate of college attendance or college completion, degree completion among Oregonians. The goal being 40% uh, having a bachelor's degree or higher, and we're currently at 28%. What you have to realize is that um, uh, there, many of that 28% are actually people who are not brought up here in Oregon. Uh, there are people who came to Oregon with degrees. We have a, you know, Oregon is a magnet state. And so a lot of people uh, have come with their degrees, and that masks, I think, the severity of the problem, which is that, uh, Far too many young Oregonians are not able to go through the system uh, and, and, you know, into success in higher education. They're they're falling through the cracks. In, in some cases, those cracks are happening between community college and university. And so, it's really important for us to improve our articulation uh, to have practices like Cohen Goldman. Uh, but also, uh, last session we passed a bill uh, creating what we call the uh, Transfer Student Bill of Rights and Responsibilities that's going to make it uh, much easier to create alignment between community colleges and higher ed. That's another benefit of this sort of more unitary system. A lot of people are dropping out between high school and, uh, and college. You know, for people who are from backgrounds of privilege, they can take off a year and um, sort of explore themselves and you know discover themselves and then come back because there is all sorts of family support and it's just always been part of their life plan that they're going to go to college and university. We have a lot of students where that does not apply to them. 
And so the more that we can keep them on track, the better. And one of the best ways of doing that is actually exposing them to college courses while they're in high school uh, through dual credit, through advanced placement, through uh, international baccalaureate. All of that needs to be worked on. And I think the best framework for doing that is uh, you know, uh, a unified uh, system that the investment board is trying to do. Uh, and so that's what we're wrestling with. And let me just say, actually, because I use the word we, a couple of my colleagues from the legislature have just come in. Uh, Chris Harker over there from uh, the west side, uh, he's on the higher ed committee, and Lou Frederick from North Northeast Portland, who's on the education committee. Let me just, because I think that's a very significant point that Representative Nimbro brought up. Um, when I first came to Oregon in 92 and we were trying to talk about seamless education and I was working with the uh, outer southeast uh, neighborhood and there were kids that would have a big graduation from middle school. And I asked, why is there such a big graduation from middle school? There's a prom, there's a limo, there's a, you know, da 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 And they said, that's because that's it. And I said, that can't be it. That can't be what you think is the terminal in our society. And this is almost 20 years ago. Well, we have been working to change that narrative. We haven't worked enough. And as long as we don't have the opportunity for kids to understand that you can go through this whole system, that there are um, some parts in there for you, then we will continue to, to lose kids who think that if I get to eighth grade, and that also refers back to the, the point I made before about we've got to change the whole narrative about, about um, what it means to become educated. And, and that only happens when you stop thinking about this is my little piece of it. Got together with a group of, of um, educators, actually, some may say that loosely because they were mostly university presidents. Um, and, uh, and we were trying to talk about how do you get more involved in your community. That was a joke. <laughs> how do you get more involved in your community when you're a university? And we start picking apart some of the different points to it. And then one night, one of the evenings, you know, or maybe some refreshments, um, we got to, why is it that we play the blame game? Why is it that universities say, oh, if they got better either in the community colleges, and they say, well, if they got a better education in high school, and they say, if they got a better, you know, and we pass it down, and we said, well, what's the solution to this? Well, you know, one of the ways they said the solution was they needed to recall the defective sperm. <laughs> um, but we're really good at saying, this is what's wrong with them, rather than looking at ourselves and saying, this is what we need to do, all of us. And this whole seamless piece is a part of that to say, we're not going to say that the third grade is, is, is the nexus of all our problems. Yes, I know that's where we plan prison beds from and all kinds of things like that. You know that, right? We plan the number of prison beds we're going to need by the, by the students that don't do well in the literacy test in the third grade. We borrowed that from California, but it seems to be a useful formula. What does that mean in terms of how we encounter that whole spectrum? And, and I think that's what the seamless question uh, makes us stand up and take.